No more bitterness, hatred or greed. Paradise is the place we need. I feel the peace inside of me. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues. I'm going to be speaking today as if I am interviewing myself. I have received a number of questions from a variety of people over time, and I thought that it would be fun for me, hopefully interesting to you, to hear me answer some of these questions. So, let us begin. In one of the earlier episodes, I described the pathway by which I became Muslim. I have been asked, one of the questions I have been asked is, what happened to me after I became Muslim? Did I encounter any difficulties? Well, I think it's very difficult for anybody to make such a radical change in their life, especially in the West, to become Muslim and not encounter difficulties. I remember that initially I had an overwhelming feeling of peace and contentment. And in a very large way, that feeling has never left me. But my worldly life was thrown into turmoil. My parents could not understand my choice. My brother had become Muslim before me, and he is actually the one who introduced me to Islam. And we are the only two children in the family, just my brother and myself. So when I became Muslim, my parents felt like they had lost their only other child to Islam. Now, my parents, during my time with them, were never practicing Christians. But all the same, they saw my conversion as disruptive to their lives. And I think it was it is almost impossible to convert to Islam or to make as large a change as a person makes when you change religions without having it be disruptive to some degree. So I admit, I was a little bit like the reformed smoker. I couldn't talk about anything else. I was probably a little bit overbearing in my opinions, but all the same. In very short order, my friends deserted me. My parents did not want to have any contact with either my brother or myself. I remember one time we actually received a message where, where we were told by them, do not visit, do not call, do not write, we do not want a postcard, email, nothing. They did not want any contact from us whatsoever. So I was cut off from friends, I was cut off from family, I was treated differently at work. What is now my ex-wife became my ex-wife. She divorced me and she took the children. I lost, of course, in the process, I lost my house, I lost my property, I lost my car. You know, it sort of sounds almost like a country song because I also lost my dog. But no, this is not one of those cases where I lost my wife and my dog and gee, I really miss my dog. No, you know, that's good for a country song, but it's not good for reality. The fact of the matter was that it was very traumatic. And I remember as I was going through all of this, I went from living on a country estate. We had a couple of acres, I don't know if you could call it an estate, but. We had a couple of acres with a very large house and a second guest house, not a guest room, a guest house on the property. And uh, I went from living in that to living in a little rent by the week studio apartment that when you walked to it up the stairwell or in the elevator, it reeked of urine to give you an idea of the quality of people living there. And not only living in this miserable little studio apartment, but sharing it 
with another brother who was getting divorced and who was on hard times. And the funny thing about it was I remember that those were some of the happiest days of my life. I remember looking around and thinking, what's wrong with me? I mean, in the movies, when you get divorced, you become dysfunctional. You start punching holes in walls and, and uh, you know, causing deliberate accidents with your car. And, and uh, you just become dysfunctional. But I was happy. As a matter of fact, as I said, it was some of the happiest days in my life. And it was then that I remember, looking back on it, that before I became Muslim, I had prayed a prayer called the Istikhara prayer, the guidance prayer. And in this prayer, we ask God, we ask Allah to choose for us, to guide us to what he knows to be best for us and to bring it to pass and to make us pleased with it. And it was then that I realized the mercy of our creator when he answers a prayer, how completely he answers it because he had chosen for me what he knew to be best for me in answer to this prayer. Not only that, but as much as I felt a dislike for what was happening, he had made me happy with it in a way that I almost could not understand. Truly, our Creator speaks the truth, and we are promised in this religion that you do not give up anything for the pleasure of Allah, except that he replaces it with that which is better. When I became Muslim, I became divorced. Allah gave me another wife. I lost my children to custody in the first family. Allah gave me a new child and a new family. Eventually, I was squeezed out of my job because of the anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim prejudices in the military, which is where I worked. I felt I could not continue because of the prejudices that I was experiencing from my co-workers. I gave up my job. Allah gave me a better job, times and times better. I lost my house to the divorce. Allah gave me a home in the holy city of Medina. I lost my wealth. Allah replaced it and multiplied it. I cannot think of anything I lost except that Allah replaced it with what he knew to be better. I didn't lose my parents forever. Eventually, we were able to talk again. And in a way, I feel our relationship is better now than it ever was before. So I think what I can say is for a person who considers making this change, Nobody gives up anything for the pleasure of Allah except that Allah will give you what is better. That doesn't mean that it, it won't be hard. It doesn't mean that it will be to your liking, at least maybe not initially. There may be a period of trial, a period of test, a period you have to get through before you find the benefit. But when you do find the benefit, subhanAllah, you will realize the completeness of the mercy of our Creator. Another question that people ask, they like to hear an answer to is, well, what does Islam mean to you? I can tell what I have found Islam to be. I have found Islam to be a religion of modesty and humility. It's a religion of peace and submission. Submission to God, but also submission in a general sense, submission to those who know better. You know, I grew up in the West, where we were raised on the concept of questioning authority. Question everything. It's a popular saying. But the fact of the matter is it's destructive. We have authority figures for a reason. They are people of greater knowledge or greater experience, or they have been empowered to enforce certain regulations. And if you are constantly questioning them or defying them, it will be hard on you, hard on them, and hard on all of society. So I found Islam to be a religion that put things in order as an individual, within a family, within a society, within a country, and as a world. I found 
Islam is a religion of peace. This does not mean that Muslims are necessarily pacifist. It does not mean that if you go and attack a Muslim, he will not defend himself. Of a certainty, he or she should, because everybody has the right to defend themselves. But it does mean that I found Islam to be a religion of peace. Before Islam, I didn't have peace in my life. I cannot remember ever having peace in my life until Islam. After Islam, I found peace in practically everything I did. Before Islam, I was fascinated with certain things. I was interested in knives. I was interested in guns. I used to play paintball. Look, I was in the military. It's something that we did. It's something in the West that we enjoyed. I watched the Rambo movies, the Commando movies, the James Bond movies. I lived that life. I dreamed those dreams. But something happened to me after I became Muslim that I can't explain, except to say I simply lost interest in all of those things. I sold or gave away my guns. The same thing with my hunting knives and my this and that knives. Something entered my heart to where I did not even like to see a knife with a tip to it. You go to my kitchen, and you will find two things. You will find my wife annoyed at me because of the second thing, which is that I've taken all the kitchen knives and broken the tips off of them. I honestly cannot understand the need for a tip to a kitchen knife. Nobody ever uses it. And it is only something that can cause harm. In my transition from a relatively unordered, somewhat paranoid life to a life of peace, things like this became visible to me that I never saw before. And I became what I feel is what I am now, a man at peace with himself, at peace with the people around me, at peace with society at large. We're going to take a break right now. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Is the place we need. Welcome. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown continuing with the discussion I started at the beginning of this episode of Interfaith Issues. Basically, I am answering questions that I feel the audience has expressed interest in or is interested to know the answers to. And I will continue from where I left off. I think one uh, common question that comes up for any Muslim is simply what groups they belong to or what groups they endorse. I was just speaking of the fact that when I became Muslim, I found that my life became much more peaceful, much more enjoyable, much more fulfilling. And I can't explain all of the reasons for that, except that Islam is a religion of peace, and it is a mercy from our Creator that, that He blesses us with this feeling. When you feel that you are on the right path, doing the right thing, recognizing your Creator, and worshiping Him in the manner that He desires and deserves to be worshiped in, that peace simply enters your life. But for me, when it comes to joining groups, I have never been particularly interested in that. There are, of course, a lot of Islamic groups, and they all have their own enticement. But I have never been one to, to really join a group. I guess at the heart of things, I'm pretty much a loner. That's the way it is, and I'm happy that way. And Islam gives us the right to remain true to ourselves. Over time, I have found a couple of organizations that uh, I feel are doing good work. One of them is the Canadian Dawa Association, based in Toronto. And they have appointed me their Director of Interfaith Affairs. Obviously, I'm filming these episodes for Peace TV for a reason. From what I have seen, Peace TV is doing a good job of conveying the peacefulness of Islam 
and the truth of its teachings. Then again, if I find that any organization I have worked with or I have joined ever expresses views which are different from my own, I would be the first to try to correct them, to criticize, and failing that, to leave. It's just an element of my being, but in becoming Muslim, I have transitioned from a very imbalanced life, a life in which everything I did was for money, everything I did was for worldly pursuits, to a life in which my pursuit is the pursuit of peace, not only for myself, but for those around me, and to improve myself as a Muslim, and to spread the message of revelation. That doesn't mean that everybody has to accept it. Our job is only to convey the message. My platform is to recognize that everybody has the individual right to freedom of choice of religion. We as human beings, hopefully as golden rule human beings, would like to treat others the way we expect them to treat us. So we should tolerate individual choices of religion as long as they are not destructive. And, if possible, work toward a global ethic, an ethic that all people can embrace as a code of life, a universal code which can be accepted by all people cutting across religious and cultural boundaries in the hope that humankind can arrive at an agreement upon a global ethic. That is what I strive for. But as far as joining groups, frankly, I try to stay away from them. Next question. Somebody asked me a question just the other day, which I thought was one of the best questions I've heard for a long time. And that was a Christian who approached me and just said, how do you know? I want to believe, but I want to have certainty. So how do you, as a Muslim, feel that you know that you are on the correct path? I think my answer to that question is simply that religion is as much a state of the heart as it is a state of the mind. We arrive at belief in God through a process of looking around ourselves, asking if this incredible frame of existence could possibly exist without a creator. Praying to that creator to guide us, and then receiving guidance, following. That's what happened to me, and that's what happened to a lot of others who I know of who have become religious at some point in their lives. In the end, people are different. Some are intellectual, some are emotional. Some have a balance in between. But the one thing that we have in common is that in the words of Malcolm X, we are one mankind united under one God. Well, perhaps united is not the correct word because we're not united, but we are one mankind under one God. And we hope it someday to be united. We haven't achieved it yet. But if people work towards what I described, recognizing each individual's right to freedom of religion, tolerating individual differences in religious choice, as I said, as long as it is not destructive, and working towards a global ethic that all of us can accept, not only for ourselves, but for others, we have a chance of achieving that. But back to the question, how does anybody know that they are upon the right path? Well, each person simply has to ask their heart. Because the fact of the matter is, we all know that there are a myriad of religions out there. And we all know that for every religion, there are devoted followers who think that they are upon the right path. 
And we all also know that if there is only one creator, there can only be one religion that is most pleasing to him. So there can only be one religion of truth, whereas all others are to one degree or another deviant, astray. The only way I know of to be absolutely certain that you're on the right path is to pray for guidance. And interestingly enough, I have found that when you suggest that to most religious people, most of them say, oh, you know, I could never do that. That would be insulting to my creator. I'm already a, you can fill in the blank. I'm already a Buddhist, Jew, Christian, Hindu, whatever. It would be insulting to my God if I asked him to guide me to the religion of truth. Well, it seems like a bit of a vain argument. Muslims pray 17 times a day minimum. 17 times a day, they ask their creator for guidance. They don't pray 17 times a day, they pray five times a day. But within the prayer, the supplication is repeated. So it comes out to having said 17 times a day, minimum, the Muslim says 17 times a day, minimum, ihdina surato mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. Surato ladina anamta alayhim ghayri al maqdubi alayhim wala dhalin. The path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed thy grace, those whose portion is not wrath and who go not astray. So five times a day Muslims pray, but when you add up the repetition of what we say during the prayer, 17 times a day Muslims ask their creator to guide them to the straight path, the path of those upon whom he has bestowed his grace, those whose portion is not wrath and who go not astray. Is there any way that anybody can object to that prayer? But I would submit that it is the path of that prayer that will bring certainty into a person's heart. You don't have to be a Muslim to pray it. You don't have to be a Muslim to pray that prayer any more than you have to be a Christian to pray our Lord's Prayer. But what you have to be what you do have to be is sincere. You have to sincerely want to recognize God and you have to sincerely appeal to him to guide you and receiving that guidance, you have to accept it and follow. So I will conclude this talk and invite all those who are interested in submitting any other questions. Please visit my websites leveltruth.com, L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H dot com, and eighthscroll.com, E-I-G-H-T-H, scroll, S-C-R-O-L-L dot com. Please drop me an email, and I will add it to a list. When we have enough and when it's interesting, we'll try to put together another talk like this one. So this is Dr. Lawrence Brown bidding you peace and concluding once more another episode of Interfaith Issues. I feel the peace. I feel